Today's video is going to focus on stress tests and the different type of stress tests that we can offer patients. Although this is geared more towards physicians, I've often found patients to be very interested in learning more about why we're choosing a specific type of stress test. What I always tell physicians is you have to divide up stress tests into two factors. First, you have to determine how you're going to stress a patient. Then you need to determine how you're going to image a patient. The most common error that we see is patients are having exertional symptoms. So a doctor orders a stress test that's not with exercise because they're afraid the patient might get symptoms. I always tell people this is like driving a car where every time you get the stoplight, your car stalls. You bring it to the garage, the mechanic looks at it and says the car looks fine. You want the mechanic to drive the car and you want the car to stall when the mechanic's driving it. Hopefully that helps the mechanic figure out what's wrong with the car. If patients have symptoms when they exercise, our goal is to reproduce their symptoms and look at the heart while they have symptoms. If their heart, while they're having symptoms, looks worse than what it did without symptoms, then we know specifically what's wrong and what's causing the symptoms. If patients are able to reproduce their symptoms and the heart function looks better with the patient having symptoms, then it's not the heart that's causing the symptoms. So if someone can't exercise, we almost always want people to exercise to do the stress test, regardless of how you're imaging them. So if a patient can't exercise, we want them to exercise for the most part. So who don't we want to exercise? If somebody has a large aorta where we're doing a stress test to see what their cardiac risk is before surgery, it's not a safe thing for that patient to exercise. So those types of people, we don't want to exercise. Some patients can't exercise because they have a broken knee or hip and they're doing it before surgery. Or for another reason, they have orthopedic issues and they can't exercise. Well, there at that time, we have to use some drug to do the stress test and not exercise. In many labs, you can do a combination of exercise and a drug. And that's actually the best way of doing a stress test. If someone can't get their heart rate up high enough, we're able to give a medication, get the benefits of exercise, exercise decreases the side effect of medications, and combining both actually improves the pictures, especially if you're doing nuclear images. If someone can't exercise at all, then we have two different classes of drugs that we can use to do the stress test. The first are what we call vasodilators. Adenosine was the older drug similar to dipritamol. Regadenosine is essentially a more specific, newer version of adenosine, but dipritamol has higher side effects than both adenosine and regadenosine, so we rarely use dipritamol anymore, and those side effects also last for a longer period of time. So most labs use either adenosine or regadenosine. The other way of doing the stress portion is with a drug called dobutamine, and dobutamine increases your heart rate. So with adenosine and regadenosine, those drugs work because if you have a blocked artery, it will dilate the other arteries normally. The artery that's blocked won't dilate normally, and we'll be able to see a difference in the flow compared to the vessels that do dilate to the vessel who doesn't dilate. Dobutamine works similar to exercise. It increases the heart rate, and it increases the demand for oxygen of the heart, and we give the dobutamine at increasing doses until the patient gets to their target heart rate. So those are the different ways of stressing people. The next factor is how do you image them? Everybody gets EKG. So patients say, well, if you're going to do echo images, don't you think I should get EKGs? Yes, everybody that has a stress test gets EKGs done. So everybody gets hooked up to an EKG. Well, who gets EKGs alone? An EKG stress test has what we call a sensitivity and specificity on average of about 70%. And what that means is if you take all comers getting a stress test, if you have 10 normal EKG stresses, seven people are normal, but three people actually have heart disease that you miss. If you have 10 abnormal stress tests, seven of those people actually have coronary artery disease, but three don't. And those three people may end up with more invasive testing that they didn't need because of the stress test. So then someone would say, why would you do this if it only has an accuracy and it put that in quotes of 70%? We only do this in people that have a low pretest probability. And what that means is if you have chest pain and you're a low risk of having heart disease and you do an exercise ECG stress and it's normal, the likelihood of having heart disease, depending on how low your pretest probability is 1% or less. Meaning if you do an EKG stress and that's normal, then that person doesn't have coronary disease. 
if you do an EKG stress and it's abnormal, then at that point, usually we do an imaging type stress after that, unless it's very abnormal, we may go straight to an angiogram. So if the pretest probability is low, and exercise ECG stress is the best thing to do. It's the quickest and the least costly test. Unfortunately, some insurers, even in patients that have moderate risk, force us to do an EKG stress first because they won't pay for a stress echo or a nuclear stress. So even though a physician may want an imaging stress done, insurance companies often dictate and state that we can't do it. If someone's moderate or high risk, they need to have either ultrasound or nuclear pictures. And they're not exactly interchangeable. Ultrasound pictures will also look at valves. It can also measure the pressures in the lungs, but the ultrasound pictures are looking at the wall motion. And a wall motion abnormality is a late stage in patients with blockages in the arteries. Meaning if somebody's got a blockage in the exercise, the first thing that happens if an area is not getting enough blood flow is it actually gets a little stiffer. It doesn't get weaker it gets stiffer first because the muscle cells can't relax because it doesn't get enough oxygen. Eventually that patient develops an area where that doesn't move well on the ultrasound pictures, but a stress echo, if someone needs to exercise long enough in order to see that. So stress echo can miss a few blockages if patients either can't exercise long enough or the blockage isn't significant enough. Nuclear pictures look directly at the blood flow. So nuclear pictures are a little more accurate than echo pictures at looking at the blood flow to the heart itself. But nuclear pictures can't see the valves at all. It can't measure the pressures inside the lungs. So if somebody has a murmur, if we're listening with the stethoscope and we hear a murmur and somebody gets short of breath when they exert themselves, the question at that point is, are they short of breath because of a blockage in an artery? Are they short of breath because of valvular problem? Or are they short of breath because of higher pressures in the lungs? And that's not something we can assess with a nuclear study. That's something that would be done with a stress echo. If a patient has an abnormal wall motion, so if somebody's had a heart attack or somebody's been bypassed, which often causes a part of the heart called the septum to contract a little bit late, doing subjective review of echo pictures before and afterwards is more likely to cause either false negatives or false positives. The nuclear pictures look directly at the blood flow and not just the wall motion. So nuclear pictures are better at determining if someone's got a baseline wall motion abnormality, if they're at risk of having another heart attack, or if that wall motion abnormality is due to something else or a damaged muscle already. If you're a patient and you're going to have a nuclear stress test, there are different isotopes that we use, and all an isotope is, it's a radioactive particle, which we put through an IV into your bloodstream. There's a very minimal dose of radiation with very good stress tests. There's an agent called rubidium that we use with pet stresses, and you're going to expose yourself to more radiation if you fly from Chicago to St. Louis being at 30,000 feet than you would during the stress test. So those are very minute amounts of radiation although it still is a radiation dose. So if you're an under 50 year old female and you might get pregnant, avoiding radiation if at all possible should be done and those patients should not be getting a nuclear stress unless there's some reason they have to have that and not a stress echo. There's an older agent called thallium and if you're a patient in a smaller center, you probably should ask your physician, are they using thallium? Because thallium is a very high radiation dose. And if they're going to do a nuclear stress test with thallium, it's probably not a great idea to do it. And at that point, it will go to a different center that would offer something such as technetium, which has what we call a shorter half-life, meaning the radiation exposure is less because it's out of your system much faster. So thallium should be avoided if at all possible. And you're a physician at an institution and you have a say in what can be done, eliminating thallium would be a very good idea. There are a few specific reasons to use thallium, but they're metamodalities and there will be a completely separate lecture specifically looking at viability. In today's age, patients can usually see most of their reports, especially in systems that have electronic records. Patients have access to their records and I think patients should have access to their records. They can see everything that we're putting in their chart. It's their body. It's their right to have access to the records. The problem with that, however, though, is when we write things in medical jargon, patients see a report and they don't always know what they're looking at. Sometimes referring physicians also don't know what we're referring to. 
So you'll see in reports, people will say there's a fixed defect or a fixed wall motion abnormality, or there's a reversible defect or a reversible wall motion abnormality. When we say that, what we're talking about fixed is if somebody's got an area on an echo that doesn't move, or an area on a nuclear study on the resting image that doesn't get enough blood flow, and that area is the same on the stress pictures, we assume that that area has been damaged and the patient has a heart attack. And as long as that area isn't bigger in the stress image, they're not ischemic. And we call that fixed. And ischemic just means there's an area that's not getting enough blood flow. If we say that something is reversible, either that means that that area is bigger or it was normal at rest and it's abnormal at stress. And if something's reversible, that means there's a blockage in an artery which isn't completely blocked. And if we fix it, we can prevent that area that we're seeing that's abnormal from becoming damaged. The importance of doing this is once heart muscles damaged, we can't fix it. You can restore the blood flow to the artery, but now you have great blood flow going to dead heart muscle and that's useless. So it doesn't help the patient. So getting to a patient and preventing them from damaging the heart muscle is the key of doing these stress tests. That goes back to lifestyle where I've talked about exercise. If patients have reproducible exertional symptoms, those are the patients we're doing a stress test is going to be very important. And that's why I started the lecture by saying if they have exertional symptoms, reproducing those exertional symptoms on a treadmill is going to be very helpful. One caveat for physicians, oftentimes, both on echo and nuclear pictures, when we say a fixed defect, we're assuming that that patient's had a heart attack. It is possible that a patient has a very significant blockage, let's say a 99% blockage in an artery, where there's so little blood flow going to that muscle that even at rest, that muscle function isn't normal, or even at rest in the nuclear pictures, it looks like there's no blood flow going to the area. So if there's an area that's fixed, and you have concerns that a patient's never had a heart attack, doing what we call a viability study, which can be done either with PET scans, and the most common agent that we use is a radioactive glucose called FDG, or an MRI to look to see if that heart muscle is alive, but what we call hibernating, it would be a very good idea. I hope you found this helpful. Let me know if you have any questions. Enjoy the afternoon.